Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. We'd like to go ahead and get today's uh, lecture started. My name is Yvette Subramanian. I'm with Citrus. And I'd like to welcome the web viewers. As you know, Citrus is a four-campus UC institute, so we have viewers at the other three campuses, Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz, gathering and watching and having lunch as well. So hello, everybody. Uh, there are flyers in the back for our Eye for Energies talk. Uh, those are on Friday at noon, also in here. And this week we have Barbara Hayden. She's going to be here from SRI. And we also have um, a lecture today. The iSchool is having a talk in 202 South Hall at 4 o'clock p.m. It's called Rumors of the Web's Demise with Roy Bahat. And uh, if you're interested in that, it's got, there's, lecture, there's um, flyers in the back. It's today at 4. I know there are... A little concerned that the Giants game may um, conflict with people attending that talk. So if you're interested, do plan to attend, please. So I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have Professor Nelson Morgan. He is the director of um, the International Computer Science Institute, known as ICSI. It's an independent, not-for-profit research laboratory that's closely, closely affiliated with UC Berkeley. In addition to directing the institute, he has led the speech group at ICSI since 1988. He is a professor in residence here at the EECS department, where he received his PhD in 1980, and he has been working on problems in signal processing and pattern recognition since 1974, with a primary emphasis on speech processing. His current research interests include the redesign from first principles of the primary signaling, signal processing used in speech recognition and the use of neural networks for the design of these new features. So please join me in welcoming Professor Nelson Morgan. Thanks. So, uh, turned 60 not all that long ago, and it uh, occurred to me that there was this connection, that speech recognition is about that old, too, and uh, the two of us are uh, not all that mature, although we have reached this age. So I thought I'd talk about that. Um, old is not the same as mature. Age does imply a fair amount of experience, but mature sort of implies understanding. And humans, definitely, can be, still be immature at 60, but so can fields of endeavor. So what about speech recognition? So it seems like it's mature to many people. There's this long research history. It is indeed old. There's been lots of projects, many, many publications for, for decades, four, six decades. The systems in the last 10 years have actually converged pretty much with fairly minor changes. Uh, speech recognition is available in many commercial products, and it works for quite a few things. But here's why it's not, immature, not mature. It fails where people don't, in many, many situations. People can listen to things and understand what's said in many situations where the machines fail badly. There's really very little basic science to this field. There's a little bit, but not much lately. It's mostly engineering. And the engineering methods typically require large data sets. In cases where you don't have really large data sets, uh, it, it, it can really be a problem. And you have to essentially start over each time, each time you have a new problem or a new task. So it doesn't, it's not the same sort of thing. I guess uh, there's a friend of mine who likens this field uh, to the difference between the Ptolemaic system of astronomy versus uh, what you had with uh, Copernicus and Kepler. Uh, you could actually make the Ptolemaic system with uh, the Earth at the center of the universe work pretty well if you just kept adjusting a little bit each time. But it wasn't a really good model because you had to adjust it each time. So how did we get here? Uh, the first publication I know of that was sort of a serious research paper was done at Bell Labs in 1952. They did um, isolated digit recognition. And there have been many publications since then. The major advances in modeling, particularly in uh, statistical modeling, happened by the 70s. Major improvements in the features that are fed to the statistical engines happened pretty much by 1990. That's 20 years ago, along with methodology improvements. Prior to that, people were do doing all sorts of experiments without, frankly, a lot of good scientific controls. And that got worked out much better uh, by 1990 or so. Okay, what's happened in the last 20 years? Well, you know that Moore's Law has pushed the computational capabilities and storage capabilities enormously. And as that has happened, the systems end up being much more detailed, representing the data uh, in, on a finer basis, and uh, doing much better. 
but it really seemed to follow Moore's law more than anything else. Furthermore, with competitive evaluations, the systems have pretty much converged. The competitive evaluations pushed a lot of uh, research, but it ended up with everyone copying whatever was the best good thing, uh, best new thing, and so the systems really converged. But as I said, there's still huge remaining problems. Now, there was a vision that was given in a, an Apple video in 1987, and uh, bear with me, I'm going to play this for a few minutes. Uh, this is what Apple thought speech recognition and speech understanding was going to be like in 1987. Uh, right. You know, advertising video, so they start off with some nice music. Picture of a desk, lots of things on the desk, but this is going to be where the knowledge navigator lives. And here's the professor coming into his tiny little office. Sorry about the quality of the video. It's been through a few transfers, through a few transfers. You have three messages. Your graduate research team in Guatemala, just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father's surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm-hmm, fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact Jill. I'm sorry, she's not available right now. I left a message that you had called. Okay. Let's see. There's an article about five years ago, Dr. Flemson or something. He really disagreed with the direction of Jill's research. John Fleming of Uppsala University. He published in the Journal of Earth Science of July 20 of 2006. Yes, that's it. He was challenging Jill's projection of the amount of carbon dioxide being released to the atmosphere through deforestation. I'd like to recheck his figures. Here's the rate of deforestation he predicted. Mm-hmm. And what happened? Hmm. He was really off. Give me the university research network. Show only universities with geography nodes. Show Brazil. Copy the last 30 years at this location at one month intervals. Excuse me, Jill Gilbert is calling back. Great, put her through. Hi Mike, what's up? Jill, thanks for getting back to me. Well, I guess that new grant of yours hasn't dampened your literary abilities. Rumor has it that you've just put out the definitive article on deforestation. Aha. Uh -huh. Is this one of your typical last minute panics for lecture material? No, 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 that's not until, um... 4.15. Well, it's about the effects that reducing the size of the Amazon rainforest can have outside of Brazil. I was wondering, um, it's not really necessary, but, uh... Mm, yes? Uh, it would be great if you were available to make a few comments. Nothing formal. After my talk, you would come up on the big screen, discuss your article, and then answer some questions from the class. And bail you out again? Well, I think I could squeeze that in. You know, I have a simulation that shows the spread of the Sahara over the last 20 years. Here, let me show you. Nice. Very nice. I've got some maps of the Amazon area during the same time. Let's put these together.
great. I'd like to have a copy of that for myself. Hmm. What happens if we bring down the logging rate to 100,000 acres per year? Hmm. Interesting. I can definitely use this. Thanks for your time, Jill. I really appreciate it. No problem. But next time I'm in Berkeley, you're buying the dinner. Dinner, right. See ya, 4.15. Bye-bye. While you were busy, your mother called again to remind you to pick up the birthday cake. Mm, fine, fine, fine. Um, print this article before I go. Now printing. Okay, I'm going to lunch now. If Kathy calls, tell her I'll be there at 2 o'clock. Also, find out if I can set up a meeting tomorrow morning with, um, Tom Lee. Enjoy your lunch. Hello, Professor Bradford is away at the moment. Would you like to leave a message? Michael, this is your mother. I know that you're there. I'm just calling to remind you to call your sister and pick up. <laughs> so, this was fun. I guess this was 23 years ago. Just a few comments about it. Uh, automatic speech recognition was just a small part of it. Obviously, there's lots of intelligence, lots of multimodal input, etc. Uh, there really was this fully intelligent agent could handle ambiguous and imprecise input, even completed sentences. Uh, there was no confirmation required, so it just got everything perfectly. So it never said, just checking, uh, is this what you said? Uh, it knows when he's talking to the agent, so there's points when he's talking to the other person on the, on the phone, uh, and the, the agent knows that he's not talking to him. Uh, it knows his identity. Presumably, it wouldn't do all these things for just anybody who went into the room. Uh, there was no close microphone required. He could just talk from anywhere, and uh, despite uh, the additional noise and reverberation, it would still work. Um, <clears throat> it could handle extreme changes in topic. So he could be talking about one thing, talk about another thing, didn't matter. He didn't need any kind of good model for the kind of language he was using. And uh, my bottom bullet there is just a note that uh, an example of something where people are trying to do something a little bit in this direction is this company called Siri. They have an agent uh, that they call a virtual personal assistant, but it's, you know, 23 years later, it's still nothing, nothing like this. So uh, what can happen? Um, even simple recognition tasks can fail. In uh, very carefully controlled tests uh, with moderate amounts of noise for digit strings, the performance level is still pretty poor. Uh, acoustic noise hurts you, uh, as well as other noise that might be on the channel. Reverberation, uh, just the effect of, of multipath, multipath reflections within a room. <laughs> Unexpected speaking rates, somebody speaks uh, particularly quickly or slowly. Insufficient confidence measures. Uh, it turns out to be very important to know whether or not you're confident about the recognition that you get. Um, because there, in any well-designed task, there's some back off. There's some way to recover uh, if you know that, it's, that you're unsure. But these work to a certain extent, but not, not as much as one would like. Uh, unfamiliar topics, if someone changes the topic, I remember a recognizer we were using one point that was trained on uh, broadcast news, and uh, it worked pretty well. And then the moment the sports came on, it was terrible. Uh, unfamiliar accents, and I have a little example of that. What's the buttons? Oh no, they installed voice recognition technology in this lift. I heard about this. Voice recognition technology in a lift. In Scotland, you ever tried voice recognition technology? No. They don't do Scottish accents. Eleven. Could you please repeat that? Eleven. 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 Could you please repeat that? Eleven. <laughs> Whose idea was this? You need to try an American accent. Eleven. <laughs> Eleven. 
I said, he's Irish, you know, American. I'm not Disney. Eleven. Where in America is that? Dublin. I'm sorry. Could you please repeat that? Try an English accent, right? <clears throat> Eleven. <laughs> Eleven. Are you for the same part of England as Dick Van Dyke? I see yours on smarts. Please speak slowly and clearly. Smart house. <laughs> Eleven. I'm sorry. Could you please repeat that? Eleven. If you don't understand the lingo, a way back came to your own country. <laughs> it, it goes on, but we'll stop there. Authorization number, please. Actually, let me back up for a second. So, um, I'm now going to play something that is a little old, it's 14 years old, but this is uh, an exchange uh, from a, a, a real system. Authorization number, please. Oh, Sheraton Hotel. Please repeat. Sheraton Hotel. Please repeat. Authorization number, please. Two, three, one, five, fifty one. Please repeat. Two, three, one, fifty one hundred. Four. Please repeat. How many times you want me to repeat it? Please repeat. <laughs> Authorization number, please. Yeah, that's tall. Please repeat. That's telephone company. We're doing some testing. Four. Hello? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Nine. Authorization number, please. Pardon me. Three. What? Five. What? Please repeat. Three. Three. I, 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 I've got the wrong number. Please repeat. Three. 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 Please repeat. Thank you. <laughs> Authorization number, please. Yes, uh, 172. Please repeat. Say pardon? Eight. My authorization, what? Please repeat. Please what? Eight. Date? Eight. Hello? Five. Say pardon? Please repeat. Please do what? Thank you. Number, please. Eight, two, three, two, three, two. two, five. Hello? Sorry. Did you get it? Zero. Eight, <laughs> two, three, six, two. Please repeat. Five. Please repeat. Eight, two, three, two, zero, zero, five. Four. Please repeat. Eight, two, two, three, two. Please repeat. Who am I talking to? A computer? One. Hello. Thank you. Authorization number, please. Please repeat. Please repeat. 
So a couple <laughs> caveats there. Again, this was 14 years ago. Uh, a lot of the problems were with the interface uh, rather than with the pure uh, recognition technology. For instance, this really was an isolated uh, digit recognizer, and people naturally uh, were giving the whole number. So they should have told them you know, one number at a time, wait for this response. So, or better yet, have a uh, yeah, these, were, these, of course, were you know, things picked out to be funny. They, it, it did, in fact, have lots of success. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to give those caveats. But let's take a modern system and look at some of the things that uh, we see. Here's a medical transcription system. Here's, again, examples picked out to be funny, but you know, some things from medical transcription a few years ago. She's numb from her toes down. Patient was alert and unresponsive. The lab test indicated abnormal lover function. <laughs> the skin was moist and dry. I like this one especially. The patient had waffles for breakfast and anorexia for lunch. Uh, to make these things work, particularly for large vocabulary, you rely heavily on a very strong language model. That is something that gives you your prior probabilities of a particular word given some history. And uh, this medical thing clearly expected anorexia a lot more than what, what they were really talking about. And that, in general, is a problem. I mean, the, the one before was funny. But in, in fact, a general problem is that you can't control people. They are, in fact, going to say things other than what you expect them to say. And this gets back into the confidence issue. If they say something that's really off the charts, you have to be able to recognize that that's the case. And that's, that's hard to do. Now, a lot of the progress uh, that's been publicly reported has had to do with government-sponsored uh, uh, speech recognition work starting in the late 80s. And this was largely sponsored by DARPA, and uh, NIST did all these benchmarks. This was uh, showing uh, these tests up through 2003. It's a little hard to read, near impossible to read some of this text here, but let me just say it starts off with relatively easy tasks, uh, thousand-word recognition, uh, with a, a very simplified grammar, uh, and then 5,000 word recognition, 20,000, and then you get up to more and more difficult tasks. And uh, the general idea from these things is that you start off with a pretty high error rate. Sorry, this, this uh, axis here is the word error rate, or WER, as it's often called, which is the, sum, uh, the relative sum of all of the uh, different kinds of errors, insertions, deletions, and substitutions. And um, so you can go to harder and harder tasks, and if you just work hard at it, it goes down and down and so forth. And this is up to conversational speech. Here's a bigger picture that shows uh, stuff up through 2009. And this is mostly the case, except you notice that these lines over here for the different evaluations are pretty much flat. So the other thing that happens is that as you get up to harder and harder tasks, the uh, slope changes and it gets harder and harder to make progress with the methods that we're using. Um, I also want to point out something from these early days, a little blown up version. I just plotted these numbers. This was from uh, something called resource management. It's a thousand word with a very low perplexity. And um, started off in 88 with the best system being around 12% error. Actually, the year before, people were getting 40 to 70% as they figured out how to do this. But people worked out the engineering things and got it down to moderate level of word error rate, and then, in fact, ground away at it for several years and got it down to under 3%. Um, however, the interesting thing about this is this, these are the points that are shown uh, in most reviews of the time. But I was there, and there was actually this other one. The year after, actually, Everybody did much worse, maybe a factor of two or three worse than they'd done the year before. And this point typically isn't shown. Uh, it's just too embarrassing. 
Uh, now, there's reasons why people justify not showing it, and the uh, usual reason is that all of these points were balanced test sets. Uh, people were balancing the test sets for gender and rate of speech and so forth, so it was to be comparable to these others. You really would have to do that with this last test, and this last test was whatever NIST had in the barrel that was left over. But I find that kind of interesting, because it means as soon as you don't have exercise tight control over a number of variables, the word error rate can really jump up. So, what's the status? I've shown you some funny error cases. But a recognition system will typically behave in one of two ways. It works fine for the task, or it's terribly brittle and unreliable. And I've generally found that people who are not uh, practitioners in this field usually fall on one end or the other in their view of speech recognition. If they have had good experiences, then they think, yeah, it works pretty much. Uh, if they've had, or uh, I should say, if they haven't used it at all, they think it works pretty well. Um, but if they have tried to use it and it's failed for them, either in a personal basis or commercial basis, then they think it's completely unreliable and the guys have been working at it for 60 years, you're never going to get it to work. Uh, it sometimes fails in ways that you can follow. You can see, oh, this, this word so sounds kind of like those two words together, so I can see how I can make that mistake. And sometimes it makes things that are just completely off the wall. So uh, I'm going to play one other video. This is a case of something that uh, could be useful. There's uh, projects pretty similar to this here at Berkeley, but uh, just in the interest of fairness, I'm playing you something from CMU. Uh, and this is, as it's saying in the text here, this is uh, automated telephone-based information access. Uh, this is in India. It's uh, uh, a project dealing with an NGO in India to uh, um, help people with public health issues. Uh, if you can read that. In the tutorial, the community health worker is being taught how to use the uh, system. The facilitator listens in and is helping out. भली करे आया मुझो नालो डॉक्टर मारवी आहे आऊ तवा के सेहत जे बारे में मालूमात दिदिस तवा छाजे बाबत मालूमात हासिल करण चाहिंदा मलेरिया दस्त या साई निशान इंदिवर दस्त मुखे तवा जे गाल समझ में आई उन जे करे मेहरबानी करे पेजे गाल के दोहरायो दस्त दस्तन जी बीमारी जे करे हिए ओहा मालूमात नाहे जे कतवा के घुरजे त चो बी मालूमात आऊँ तवा के दस्तन की बीमारी के बारे में बुधाई दिस दस्तन की बीमारी बार तमाम खतरनाक है मारी वर्कर के लिए यो तमाम जरूरी आहे तो उन बीमारी के मुतल जान हो जान घुर्जे तवा के घुर्जे मालूम सबब निशान इलाज या एहतियातों जैसे तुम पैरों बार हौसो बुध चाहो था तो चो बी मालूम दस्तन की बीमारी में थे वाली निशानियों जैसे हि उ मालूम ना है जो तवा के घुर्जे तो चो बी मालूम आऊँ तवा के दस्तन की बीमारी में थे वाली निशानी के बारे में बुधाई बार जो अखियु अंदरी तरफ दबजी वी बिल्कुल so this is, this is one example of many where speech recognition really does work well enough uh, and can be quite useful. So let me go through a little bit of history quickly. Uh, as I was saying, a lot of this stuff was worked out a pretty long time ago. By 1990, people had something called dynamic time warp. Uh, also hidden Markov models were developed and a number of, of uh, important things in, in the uh, feature extraction that feeds the statistical engine. Dynamic time warp is an optimal time normalization using dynamic programming. The idea if you say cat or cat, uh, you still want to treat those as the same word. And uh, it's dynamic in the sense that you don't just shrink everything equally because some sounds are going to shrink or expand more than others. Uh, several Japanese authors uh, figured this out around by around 1970 and also one Russian, Vinciuk, uh, a couple of years before articles from the others. Uh, if you want to look up about this, it's in its 
early form, it's certainly not used particularly anymore, but it is a good basis for understanding modern things as well. Uh, George White did a review article on the transactions of ASSP in 76. Um, something that happened uh, in the 80s was a big fight between knowledge-based and ignorance-based approaches. Uh, by ignorance-based, I mean uh, things like HMMs, neural networks, machine learning, basically. And uh, there was a, a movement, particularly around folks, uh, some folks at CMU and uh, uh, Victor Zhu at, at MIT was doing some, some really good work with, with this, Ron Cole at, at CMU at the time, uh, in which they were using uh, acoustic phonetic knowledge. <clears throat> so they would note that for this kind of sound, this formant would transition from here to here in, in such an amount of time. And, and Victor Zhu was uh, particularly good at reading spectrograms. Uh, they, for many years, in fact, they may still teach it, I'm not sure, used to teach a course in spectrogram reading. So the idea was that if, if people could look at spectrograms and figure out what was said, you should be able to put down enough rules to determine that. Now, there's still some interesting things there, uh, but what happened is once there were standard data sets and people compared, uh, the, the really purely statistical approaches uh, uh, won pretty handily. Um, although I think <clears throat> there's still something to be gained from knowing some something about speech. Uh, the hidden Markov model work came from uh, mathematics developed by ba Baum and others at, at uh, Institute for Defense Analysis in Princeton. Uh, they were developing this stuff uh, for cryptography, actually. And so Baker, uh, who was a grad student at CMU, applied this to speech, and also people at IBM, uh, Baker went there later, but also Fred Jelinek and Ball and Mercer and others uh, during this period were uh, uh, figuring out how to apply this to speech. And the idea was, much like the cryptographic case, there's something you're trying to decode. There's a set of sounds or words that are coming out of here that are hidden in the code, which is your, your feature representation. Um, by the mid to late 80s, other people caught on besides IBM and CMU and figured out that this was a good path to pursue. So that was, that was an important uh, milestone. And for those of you who like graphical models, this is the simple hidden Markov model. Uh, these are uh, hidden states and these are observables. And the arrows indicate the uh, uh, dependence. In particular, you can look at them to get the uh, conditional independence that is Q3 is uh, once you know Q2, that's all you're gonna, you don't, all the influence is there for Q3 and you don't need to pay attention to X2 and Q1 anymore. Um, front ends in the 1980s, uh, people by, by the late 80s, people had developed uh, Melkepstrel representations, uh, perceptual linear prediction. These are two representations that have some, a couple properties of uh, human uh, audition, uh, but there are different ways of having, of getting some kind of a spectrum and turning that into a Kepstrom, which is the inverse Fourier transform or the DCT of uh, the uh, power spectrum. Um, delta Kepstrom is basically looking at time derivatives of the Kepstrom, and that's turned out to be important, capturing something about the dynamics of speech. And there was a bunch of work, uh, particularly in the 80s, in auditory models by uh, people at MIT and Bell Labs and elsewhere. Uh, these are interesting things that people still look at and try to get some insight from, although they didn't make it into major systems. Uh, just to give you one point about the MEL approach, the main point here is just that there's a lot more frequency resolution at low frequencies than at high frequencies, which mimics uh, human hearing to some extent because if you are listening to something and the spectral change uh, is in the high frequencies, there has to be quite a bit of it in order for it to be reflected in a perceived change in speech sound. Okay, has anything happened since 1990? Yeah, there's been some things. Um, temporal feature normalization. Uh, before 1991 or so, uh, if you recorded your training data with one microphone and then you tested with a different microphone, there was a pretty good chance it would fail. And this was handled by uh, Kepstra mean normalization. Actually, there was another thing that, that we did in Berkeley it was called RASTA, Relative Spectral Analysis, uh, which also worked pretty well. Um, speaker normalization, 
uh, was another thing. An example of that is what was called uh, vector, uh, sorry, vocal tract length normalization. The idea is someone who has a very long vocal tract, like a large male, will tend to have uh, resonant frequencies in the vocal tract that are lower down in frequency than someone with a short vocal tract. And you can normalize for this without measuring the vocal tract, just actually through statistical means. Uh, adaptation and feature transformation. There's been a lot of work in that, and this has had really a big effect on error rates. Uh, adapt, you, you may not have a huge amount of your, of your new data for your new situation, but if you have a moderate amount, you can actually adapt to that, you can adapt the statistical models that you have. You can also adapt the features, and there's other ways to transform them that have been important. Uh, discriminative training uh, in various forms, uh, handling lots of data, uh, just, just the engineering things required in order to do that, combining multiple systems and subsystems, and a lot of work on speed optimization. So where do we go from here? Um, this getting more firmly into uh, my own opinion, but better features and models. Uh, people are pretty good at this stuff. People are pretty good at, at uh, being able to say what was said under all sorts of conditions where the machines will fail. So it, it makes sense to a lot of us that we should study more about what people are doing, not in terms of rules, but in terms of basis, basic functionality, and in particular, then developing better features. Um, now, on the other end of things, better models of understanding, of language, of dialogue, and the second big thing is understanding the errors, uh, examining what the statistical assumptions are, and doing experiments to determine their relative importance. So uh, there are some people, uh, for instance, uh, Rich Stern at, at, at CMU is doing really interesting stuff on useful approximations to the periphery, that is to what you can actually measure at the auditory nerve. Um, then all the way up to primary auditory cortex, there's relatively new information uh, relatively new being over the last decade, that tells us something about that. Maybe we can make use of. Uh, there's a, a number of recent results with noise. Something that we've looked at, a number of other people have, is a mixture of auditory and not auditory processing. What I mean by that is you get some inspiration from uh, the human uh, system, uh, but you don't slavishly follow it. If there's some good engineering method that, that works, use it. Uh, for instance, uh, Wiener filtering. Maybe there's some correlate to Wiener filtering in the human system, but if you have a good Wiener filter, uh, why not use it? Now, the, all of this is just referring to a single channel and only audio, but in real life, uh, often the two ears are very important. Uh, and uh, also the visual modality can be quite helpful, particularly in a lot of noise. Uh, a little bit about the cortical stuff. Uh, if you imagine there's an auditory spectrogram here, there's time, this is frequency, and saying auditory means that it's been through some kind of processing to make it more like what you see at the auditory nerve. SDRF stands for spatial, uh, spectrotemporal uh, receptive fields, and you can have some kind of filters, sort of both in time and frequency. And then you can imagine these cubes coming out over time where you have frequency is one dimension and the other dimensions are rate and scale. Rate is sort of uh, temporal modulations, how the, how the spectrum is changing temporally over time and scale is spectral, mod corresponds to spectral modulations. And different, parts, different uh, chunks of the speech and different noises will be in different places in these cubes and it, it can be a good way to sort of separate things out. Uh, this is an implementation that we've been working with the last few years where you, we use Gabor filters to represent these uh, uh, spectrotemporal receptive fields. Uh, we didn't invent this. Lots of people do. There's people at Oldenburg and, and, and elsewhere who've uh, done a lot of work with this. Um, we feed these into multilayer perceptrons, which are really good at generating discriminant output. And they also, because if you train them right, you can get posterior probabilities of speech sounds. You can combine them in nice ways and we end up with features for that. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting for us is uh, what we like to call many stream on many core. Uh, I think a lot of you know that the direction that uh, hardware is going these days is for more and more cores rather than higher and higher clock rates uh, so that the silicon doesn't melt. And um, the, the uh, PAR lab in the, in the CS division is working particularly on this, trying to uh, figure out how to 
fit a lot of different applications on this kind of hardware. And this uh, structure that I showed is actually a pretty good match to this uh, extreme parallelism idea. Uh, in practice, we found that this uh, method can remove about half the errors for noisy numbers. For a large vocabulary without noise, it seems to remove about an eighth of the errors, and uh, we still have to get to the point where we're looking at large vocabulary with, with poor acoustics. And it also combines well with pure engineering methods. Uh, models of understanding, I believe, are very important, but it's not something I know a lot about. But it's uh, of obvious importance. Uh, it's, it's tough to improve on simple statistics, just the probability of one word given the previous three words, say. Uh, but having a stronger model of understanding, a lot of us feel has just got to be important. Uh, there's an example I tell my students sometimes. I was uh, standing in front of ICSI with an A's hat on, an Oakland A uh, jacket on, a radio stuck to my head, and I was walking down the street, and a guy yelled from across the street and asked me what the score was. And so I said, A is three to two. After a few steps, I realized what I'd really heard was, or, but given the situation, I knew what he wanted. Uh, so having a better model of understanding of pragmatics, et cetera, is, is clearly gonna be important. The other thing I just wanna mostly finish up with is uh, just understanding the errors. Uh, usually, we all just come up with bright ideas. We say, wow, yeah, human auditory cortex, that's the way to go, and we push that a bunch. But what about finding out what's wrong? We're, we're trying, our idea, uh, trying out our idea, comparing it to what we were using before, and seeing whether it got better or stayed the same or got worse. But there hasn't been enough, I think, of trying to figure out what's wrong with the current methods. Um, so, in particular, the statistical models we're using in order to train them and use them properly, you, you require a bunch of assumptions. You require various kinds of conditional and dependence assumptions, for instance. Uh, these assumptions in general are, are just known to be false. This might or might not be a problem. A lot of times in engineering, simplifying assumptions are very useful, and you know, the fact that they're not precisely correct is not a problem. But we know that we're uh, doing badly in a lot of situations. So how to learn this? There was a really neat paper by Steve Wegman and Larry Gillick about a year ago. Uh, these are two guys who uh, used to be at, at uh, Nuance. Before that, they were at, at uh, Dragon. And um, their thought was to consider each of these assumptions, uh, then th using resampling, modify the data rather than trying to modify what your models are, and observe the improvements and try to see where the uh, important uh, things are. So. This is actually being pursued right now uh, at, at our place. Okay, uh, summary slide, and two quick post-summary slides. Um, automatic speech recognition is in fact old, but in fact it is still brittle. And we, in some sense, start over again with each new task. The recent improvements, uh, by recent, especially the last 10 years, but to some extent even the last 20, have been quite incremental. And we may need more basic models. We probably need to study what is going wrong and why. And more computation, uh, such as we're going to be getting with lots more cores, may help because it may allow us to try much more complex front ends. But just having a lot more computation by itself isn't enough. We have to figure out what to do with it. And I just wanted to pay short tribute to Fred Jelinek, who uh, passed away uh, last month. He was. Uh, key pioneer in hidden Markov models for speech. Um, just wanted to say that there's a memorial for him uh, in, in a week uh, in Baltimore. And one advertisement, <laughs> if you want to know more about this stuff, uh, I teach EE251D, CS people and others are welcome. And it, it's not being taught this coming year, but it will be taught in 2012. And that's my talk. Is uh, the, the uh, situation with respect to the state of the art the same in other languages as English, or are there differ differences in other languages where automated speech recognition is more advanced? 
Well, there's certainly plenty of differences. Uh, for instance, in some languages, there's uh, a more limited syllabic uh, 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 vocabulary. And uh, in that sense, it can be simpler. Of course, some languages are tonal, which adds another kind of complexity to it. Uh, there's more uh, homophones in, uh, in some languages than in others. But to first order, uh, what happens is when people start with working with a new language, they collect a lot of data, and uh, they train up the same kinds of models, and uh, they end up with the same limitations. So, yes, they're all different, but they're all the same. <laughs> le plus même, le plus de chance. <laughs> John. So can we say at this point that the problem isn't that our databases aren't big enough? Or could it be that if we collected 100 times more data, speech data, that we have ready to train these systems, we might see a big increment because we don't have enough at this point? Well, the slope is definitely uh, not as big as it was before. So I don't think I have any way of knowing you know, if you had, say, 100,000 times as much data, whether that would fix everything. Maybe it would. I mean, clearly, if you could collect all the, all the speech that is, collect, that is possible to utter in the world, I, if you had a good search technique, then you probably would be done. But um, I think it's, with stuff that's sort of feasible to do, I think it's, it's not. I mean, there's, there is one argument to be made that with a pretty huge amount of data, uh, you still aren't there, and that is if you look at the closed captioning on, on YouTube that, that Google does, and they have a lot to work with. But, you know, I have no way of knowing how much of it they're using. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you again for a great talk. Thank you.